All right, welcome to our second week of our uh, Biochem Weekly Reviews. Um, today we are going to be talking a little bit about what we talked about last week, and then uh, we're going to build from that into next week's, uh, really just the, the bulk of this unit, which is going to be about the amino acids, about um, some of the reactions we have to do, and then a little bit more of the acid-based stuff with the, uh, the henderson hasselbalch equation. So before I jump into all that, I want to make sure that we're understanding this concept of free energy, of, of uh, Gibbs free energy. And the, um, the really important thing with Gibbs free energy that um, uh, we have to remember is that it's driven by the equation delta G is equal to, sorry, I'm not sure why it's not writing. Um, okay, there we go. Delta G is equal to delta H naught minus T delta S, right? And so just very briefly, this is enthalpy. So just the heat of the actual reaction. And this is entropy. So chaos, disorder, whatever you want to call it. Um, the, the really important things here are when we change this sign, or depending on the sign of each of these, um, delta G is either definitely going to be positive, definitely going to be negative, or it'll be temperature dependent. And so um, just a quick recap, when delta G is less than zero or negative, a reaction is spontaneous spontaneous okay uh, and that's why when we look at the uh, the third row of this chart I'll make sure I'm recording I just realized just in case okay yes I am good um, when we look at the third row of this chart we see that when Delta H is negative and Delta S is positive we have a negative minus another negative number and we get the value for Delta G is always negative and so therefore a reaction with that is always spontaneous. Likewise, with that, if this reaction is always spontaneous, the reverse reaction is never spontaneous, um, and so on and so forth. And so, um, yeah. So just keeping in mind that we don't always necessarily need to have the exact values to figure out if something might be spontaneous is a really good help. It's a really good way to approach these problems is just to think about them. But I've been talking about delta G, and I've said delta G not sometimes, and I've sometimes just kept it delta G, What's the difference between that and also this other term, delta G naught prime? So these are all different, and I know that's a little bit annoying. Um, so as we can see in this line, delta G naught is the standard state Gibbs free energy. So standard state means every concentration is one molar. We're at 298 Kelvin, so about room temperature, and it's cut off here. It should say one, there we go, one atmosphere. So basically standard temperature and pressure with everything at one molar. Great. Delta G is the Gibbs free energy at any point. So if I tell you, for example, that you have one molar of, let's just do an easy example. Um, I have lost, there it is, okay. Um, HC, um, no, I don't like that, I'm sorry. CH3, COOH plus, NaOH. So this is an acid-base reaction. Or even I could just do the dissociation of CH3COOH. So just that. Obviously, it's going to go to the right. It's not going to follow delta G naught because we may not have one molar. We may have three molar. We may have six molar. We have whatever number. But it's going to go to the right. We need to know how far it'll go to the right, how spontaneous this reaction is at this concentration because that's what's going to tell us um, that's what's going to tell us how far this reaction is going to be driven forward whereas delta g naught the first one is going to be it's it's fixed so it's a way for us to compare reactions objectively is uh, acetic acid a stronger base than phosphoric acid is this reaction faster than this reaction whatever the case may be they tell us kind of objectively which one is going to be faster or which one is going to be more spontaneous. This second one, just dust delta G, is going to tell us for this specific concentration. And then finally, delta G naught prime is what we tend to use most often in this course because it's the standard state of biochemical systems. In other words, when the pH is about seven, when we're at about a neutral pH, delta G naught prime reflects that. So rather than having the concentration of H plus being one or something crazy, it's 10 to the negative seventh. And so this is um, this is a great example that I personally like to show. It's from, I believe it's Dr. Marsh's slides. 
And I believe so, uh, a couple of the other professors might also use similar images. But basic idea is all the concentrations are one more, delta G naught, great. Biochemical systems, pH of seven rather than pH of zero. So we incorporated that into the formula. So if in your formula H plus is consumed, we're looking at this to change between delta G naught and delta G naught prime, and this to convert between K, if you want to think of it as K naught, even though it's not really, and K prime, okay? And if it's produced, we get a very similar, but also opposite reaction, or uh, but also opposite. So rather than multiplying by 10 to the negative seven, we divide here, okay? so. The, the conversion between delta G naught and delta G naught prime are not the most important thing, but I do want to introduce it because those terms are thrown around quite often. It's really important to understand what they mean. However, calculating delta G is important. So if a certain reaction has a, and I apologize, this does have a typo, these should be knots. So if a certain reaction has a delta H naught, or yeah, a delta H naught of 32 kilojoules per mole, and a delta S naught of 250 joules per mole, at what temperatures will this reaction be exergonic? So I'm thinking to myself, these are both positive terms. So I'm just gonna quickly look right here. Uh, both positive, it's going to be temperature dependent and it's spontaneous at high temperatures. Okay, that's really good to know. So now I already know it's gonna be at some point greater. So, ah, that's the other thing I forgot to mention. This word exergonic is sometimes talked about, sometimes not. So you guys have learned exothermic and endothermic. Those are when it releases heat and gives off heat. Exergonic and endergonic are the exact same thing except with free energy. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So this reaction is exergonic if it releases free energy. And it's endergonic if it takes in free energy. In order to release free energy, it needs to be spontaneous. So exergonic, excuse me, is another term for spontaneous. Spontaneous. In other words, at what temperature is delta G not less than zero? Okay, makes sense. So now let's figure that out. So we need delta G not to be less than zero. In other words, given that we know that delta G naught is equal to, and I'm gonna stop saying the knots just because it gets a little exhausting, uh, delta H plus T delta S. We can substitute these in for that, and we get delta H, I'm, I'm sorry, I think I might have said plus, that should have been a minus. Minus T delta S is less than zero. So we need to figure out when that's true, and our numbers. So in a and this is something that is just be, be careful about is the units. So the standard unit you're gonna be given for delta H is kilojoules per mole. The standard unit for delta S is usually joules per mole. So if you wanna do it in joules, you can do it in joules. If you wanna do it in uh, kilojoules, you can do it in kilojoules, but just stay consistent. For this one, I'm gonna convert this to 0.25 kilojoules per mole. So I'm gonna be doing this in kilojoules. You can do it the other way as well, and it's totally fine, um, but yeah. I just want to mention that. So 32 minus 0.25 T is less than zero. I'm going to subtract 32 to the, uh, no, I'll add the uh, this to the other side and get 32 is less than 0.25 T, divide 0.25, divide 0.25. And I'm going to get, <clears throat> Sorry, I don't know why it's still not typing. Um, I'm going to get that T is greater than 128. This is not 128 degrees. This is 128 Kelvin. Okay, that's really important to take note of. In other words, this reaction is spontaneous at temperatures above 128 Kelvin. Now, obviously we don't really use Kelvin, so I always just try to convert it to, to degrees Celsius because I think it's easier. And in that case, this is going to be <clears throat> This is going to be a temperature of, I'm having trouble. Um, I'm, I'm not sure why my OneNote isn't working very well, so I, I am very sorry about that, but um, the temperature is negative 145, since it doesn't, negative, oh, there we go. Okay, negative 145 degrees Celsius. There we go, I'm sorry for the trouble there. 
So now, as I'm sure you guys have seen the, the next question already, what will be the equilibrium constant, or K, of this reaction at 12 degrees Celsius? So this, this is kind of another re, uh, kind of homage to GenChem 2. If you remember the formula, delta G naught, and we talked about it a little bit above as well, but it's equal to negative RT times the natural log of K. So in this, we have K. R is the ideal gas constant. And we know what delta G is because we can, well, we can plug in delta G, right? So how I would approach this is I'm gonna plug in, I'm gonna actually just substitute all of this in for here. So 32, and I'm gonna once again do this in kilojoules. Actually, no, I believe we need to do this in joules because R, I, I, it depends on your units for R and I have the units for R memorized for uh, joules per mole. So 32,000 minus 250 times the temperature, which in this case is 12 degrees, but I'll substitute that in later, is equal to negative R, uh, and I'm running out of space, so I'm gonna probably start writing crooked in a second. Uh, the ideal gas constant, so you probably used 0 0.082 uh, liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. That's not an incorrect ideal gas constant, of course, but for this class, what you end up using a lot more often is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Per mole Kelvin, okay? Times the temperature, times natural log of K. So we have the temperature, so this is actually really easy to clean up. And natural log of K is what we're looking for. Um, one important note is, once again, this is Kelvin. Right, so we need to convert this to Kelvin. The way that we do that <clears throat> is by adding 273. So 12 plus 273 ends up giving us 285. So 32,000 minus 250 times 285 equals negative 8.314 times 285, oops, excuse me, times the natural log of K. So that's where we're at. Um, so we're just going to plug all this into our calculator. On the left side, we get negative 39,250. And on the right side, we get negative 2370 about. And I'm, I'm just approximating because it's more for the problem solving procedure than the exact number. We're going to divide from both sides. That should be negative. Um, and we end up getting 15 points, uh, I'm sorry, 16.6, excuse me. 16.6 .6 equals the natural log of K. To undo the natural log, we exponentiate with the base of E. I apologize, that's one of those terms I'm not really comfortable saying because it's weird to me. And we get somewhere around like 15 or like 1.6 times 10 to the 7. 1.6 times 10 to the 7th equals K. So we, so this is partially important to note because this is a great way to convert between uh, Gibbs free energy and equilibrium to convert between enthalpy and entropy and equilibrium, but also it's a great way to check our work. And here's what I mean by that. We cleaned up this left side to get something like negative 39,000. And that's negative 39,000 joules per mole. That's very, very spontaneous. Um, when, we, when we get this number, this is a really, really big positive number. And it, it, a number that's greater than one, that's also going to tell us that it's very, very spontaneous. So when these two match, we know that we've done it right. Maybe this ended up being a positive number, and this ended up being spontaneous. I know something happened and I, I did something wrong and so it's a great way to check our work as well. Okay. Does anyone have any questions about that before I, um, I move on to the next question? Okay. I'm going to assume no. I'm going to move on. So what is a Van Hoff? And I apologize, I, I can't cut it off that well. So I'm just going to, we're just going to bear with it. So a Van Hoff plot uses the relationship that we just established in the previous question 
to create a graph. And I think it's, it's awesome. Your professors do as well because you do have to know it quite well. Um, so we established that delta G naught is equal to delta H minus T delta S. And I keep forgetting the naught. We've also established that it equals negative ideal gas constant times temperature times the natural log of K. We combine these equations now. Excuse me, delta H minus T delta S is equal to negative RT times the natural log of K. And we're going to divide both sides by RT, or, sorry, negative RT. And we get on, and I'm going to flip it for convenience, the natural log of K is equal to negative delta H over R times 1 over T plus delta S over R. Okay. And the reason that we write it in this specific way is because this is a y equals mx plus b plot. Okay, So that's exactly how we use it. We graph 1 over t versus the natural log of k, like you guys are most likely going to be doing on your problem set. And when we do that, we get this relationship. So I know that the slope is the negative of the enthalpy divided by the ideal gas constant. And I know that the y-intercept is the entropy divided by the ideal gas constant. And so this gives us really easy way to just get all the values we need. And it also gives us a relationship between K and temperature. And this is something that I think is really confusing because excuse me, it's very kind of unintuitive to me how temperature and uh, equilibrium relate to each other. But so it's telling us that as the temperature increases, this side overall decreases. And we know that as that happens, the natural log of K increases. Or No, I'm sorry, decreases. I keep getting that backwards as well. And so it is a really, because so as temperature increases, K decreases, which I personally thought was unintuitive because as your temperature increases, a reaction would speed up in my head. But it actually, well, it depends on what reaction we're dealing with and everything like that. But I just, I thought that was a fascinating relationship. I don't know if anyone else agrees, but I, I like it. Um, okay, so uh, next we've got a couple of easier questions just to make sure that everyone is understanding the, the concepts. So when heat is absorbed during a reaction, the delta H of that reaction is, and uh, this is just kind of, this is a pretty similar question to what you might see on one of your exams because they, they do like to trip you up. They might say the delta H, the delta S, the delta G, whatever the case may be. But if you're absorbing heat, or I should say, if the reaction is absorbing heat, then that means that its delta H is positive because it's, it's taking in that heat. Like the heat is increasing during the reaction. And so that makes delta H positive, okay? This one is a little bit more complicated. So, or this series, I should say. So given the following reaction, answer the following questions. So this reaction is, Excuse me, I should not have been underlined. Uh, this reaction is a phosphorylation reaction of glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. It's actually the first reaction in glycolysis. Um, so we see that this oxygen gets phosphorylated and it gets a phosphate group attached to it, hence phosphorylation. So the way that this phosphor the way that this phosphate group, excuse me, is added is through this ATP. So ATP is adenosine triphosphate, okay? So the, oh, I should have mentioned. So the notation that we use in these kinds of reactions is above the arrow is the reactant. So ATP in this case is another reactant. Below the arrow are cofactors or enzymes or anything like that. So hexokinase is the enzyme that uh, catalyzes this reaction. And magnesium is a cofactor that helps move the reaction along with uh, hexokinase. So these questions are all related to um, this concept. So given a delta G naught of negative 20 kilojoules per mole at 50 degrees Celsius, what would be the delta G of this reaction if the concentrations were all 0.5 molar? So the way that I set this up is we're changing concentrations, right? 
So we have, uh, let me see, delta G naught is equal to negative RT natural log of K. And the reason I use this formula rather than the other is because K is what breaks up basically to give us our, um, um, our equilibrium, excuse me. Or, I'm sorry, K being the equilibrium breaks up to give us the ratio of products to reactants. And so this is what is affected by our concentrations, reactants, okay? So we know that this is going to be negative 20. We know the temperature, we know R, right? All we're doing is having the concentrations. So what does what is the effect of having these concentrations on this equation? What we're going to do is we're going to actually take this very easily. Um, we're going to go, we're going to first find k. Excuse me, I, I lost my train of thought. So negative 20 equals negative, and this is kilojoules. So actually, I'm going to cross that out and just convert it. Negative 20,000 equals negative. R is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin which is why I wanted to make sure everything is in joules. Uh, temperature is 50 plus 273, so that would be 323. And this is all approximate. I know that it's technically 273.15, just for convenience, I kind of, I use 273. And I know the natural log of K. So once again, we're just gonna plug it into our calculator, 20,000 divided by 8.314 divided by 323 we get 7.45 about. So natural log of K is equal to 7.45. Once again, we use, we exponentiate with E as our base to get a number around 1.7 times 10 to the third. So that's K. Awesome, we did it. Um, except now we need to find delta G. Delta G is equal to delta G naught plus, and actually I'm gonna pull this all the way back to the beginning so you guys know where I'm referencing, or what I'm referencing. We effectively use this formula right here. And what this formula is, is it's delta G is equal to delta G naught plus RT ln Q. So rather than K, we're using Q, okay? Um, let me slide over here, and I'm going to RT ln Q. We know R, that's easy. We know T, easy. Q. Q is our um, our quotient ratio, uh, our, what is it called? It's it's K at any point rather than at a fixed point. I, I apologize, I'm blanking on the, the exact name of it. So Q in this case is equal to the concentration of G6P, so our product over the concentration of regular glucose and the concentration of ATP. In other words, it's the concentration of the product over the reactants. And in this case, they're all 0 0.5. So 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Um, one of these cancels with one of this and you get zero, or sorry, one over 0 0.5, which is two. Okay, so now we're gonna say delta G naught is, so it's negative 20 kilojoules per mole, or it's uh, negative RTL and K, and we plug in the numbers. I personally like to find K in some cases just because it's, it's more curiosity than anything, but we don't have to. So I'm going to say negative 20,000 joules per mole because I want to keep everything in joules and I'll convert to kilojoules after. Plus 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Kelvin, excuse me. Uh, the temperature is 323 Kelvin. And then the natural log of two. And I just multiply all those numbers. Oh, and this should not be minus. I apologize, this is addition. I always mix up my signs, so I, I apologize for that. And we plug all those in. and we get a number out of it, which is about 1.9 thousand. So I'm, I'm gonna write 1860 because that's what it's closest to. 
Um, so it's negative 20,000 plus 1860. So just keep track of your signs. You end up getting negative 18,140. And this is um, joules per mole. Or negative 18.1 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so that's the delta G of this reaction. So one thing that I think is really interesting is that it doesn't necessarily scale. So we have the concentrations, so rather than negative 20, it could be negative 10, but it's not quite, it's not even close, right? Negative 20, negative 18, it decreased by 10% rather than by 50% or half. And so it's just something to keep in mind and something to be aware of is it's not always going to be a perfect linear relationship. And in fact, it shouldn't be a linear relationship. Okay. Number six. So this is one of my personal favorite questions because I think it makes you think. If this reaction, oh, I just realized, I apologize. I made a mistake because I forgot ADP. So ADP is here. Um, so it would actually be another 0.5. So this should actually be one. Uh, and the natural log of one is, of course, zero. I, I apologize. So the natural log of one, which makes this term zero, which actually keeps it at 20,000. I knew I did something wrong. I um, negative 20 kilojoules per mole. And the, so the, the reason for that is because we have It leaves the two left over, and so this is the other part of it, which changes our equilibrium expression. And so then it's 0.5 times 0.5 divided by 0.5 times 0.5. In other words, everything cancels and it's one. The natural log of one is zero, and so it's these two times zero, which is just zero. And so it's negative 20,000 plus zero, which is just negative 20,000. I apologize for the confusion. That's my mistake. So if this reaction weren't coupled to ATP hydrolysis, so what this react what this question is getting at is if i wanted to i could add a bunch of phosphate groups to a bunch of glucoses and try to get g6p or glucose 6-phosphate out of it it would be very very difficult to get that to happen because you because the the reason that this reaction happens as well as it does is because of the cleavage of ATP. So ATP is made up of, and I'm just going to draw this out real quick. Um, it's made up of these high energy phosphodiester bonds. And so this oxygen is pulling at both of these, these oxygens are pulling at each phosphorus and so on. And so this is kind of a mess of polarity and pulling and charges. And so, when we break one of these phosphate, phosphate, sorry, phosphorus oxygen bonds, it releases a lot of energy, like a lot of energy. And that energy can be used for the, um, for the attachment of that phosphate to this oxygen. And so that's what, what it means by couple. You can couple two reactions by using the energy from one reaction to power another reaction, okay? And the, reaction of ATP to ADP releases negative 30.5 kilojoules, I apologize, kilojoules per mole. In other words, this reaction is very, very, very spontaneous, okay? So think of it almost like an equation. Um, delta G of reaction one, plus delta G of reaction two is equal to the total delta G of the coupled reaction, which is negative 20. We know that, and I'm just gonna say reaction one is the ATP hydrolysis. We know that reaction one is negative 30.5. So the delta G of reaction two has to be uh, 10.5, right? So in other words, if I were to try to do this, release free phosphate and glucose to try to get G6P, 
This is how spontaneous, oh, excuse me. This is the Gibbs free energy of that reaction. It's very, very non-spontaneous, okay? Does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions? Um, feel free to jump in, type in the chat uh, if you do. Excuse me. So, okay, let's go to the next question. In a chemical reaction, which is just A plus H, which should be uh, H plus, plus ATP. Oh, how did we get negative 30.5? So negative 30.5, that's a number that, that I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to memorize. Um, different professors will say you have to, you don't have to, whatever. I personally believe it should have been memorized, engraved in stone, whatever, because it, it's a very important number to keep in mind. Um, that is the, the, the Gibbs free energy associated with the hydrolysis of ATP, okay? So that's just a number that it might be in your PowerPoints, your professor might have said it, but regardless, it's very important, okay? Okay. So, in a chemical reaction, A plus H plus plus ATP yields C plus ADP, and A and C are just random chemicals, or uh, random molecules, doesn't matter exactly what they are. If you have a given enthalpy and a given entropy and a given Gibbs free energy at that temperature, and you're given intracellular concentrations of ATP and ADP, we're looking for the ratio of A to C. So that's a lot of words. So let's kind of dissect. We want the ratio of A to C, A over C. That's what we're looking for. In order to get there, I think Q gives us, uh, let's see, ADP, ADP, and it gives us C, and A, H, ATP. So I have, let's see, I have the concentrations of ATP and ADP. I'm looking for the ratio of A to C. So if I can figure out the concentration of H somehow, and I can figure out my, my Q somehow again, then I can kind of bring everything together and uh, I, can, I can get that ratio. So I know that I can get Q using delta G naught and delta G. So I'm given these two values for delta H and delta S. Notice that there's not, that there isn't a naught. See, I know that's weird. There's not that little zero symbol. So that tells me that if I use these two at that temperature, I'll get delta G out of them. And I have delta G naught. So I have that, I can get to that. And so I have plus RT ln Q. So now I have a way to get Q. Awesome. Okay. And this is where we have to rely on, on uh, physiological conditions. Or I'm sorry, bio, biochemical conditions, physiological. When you're not given a specific pH, we assume that the pH is neutral. So I'm going to scroll back to the top. So these concepts here, if H plus is consumed, like it is in this equation, we can convert our K, or I should say, we should be dealing with K naught. We should be dealing with K prime slash K naught prime rather than just K prime and K. Or I'm sorry, that should have been G. I'm sorry. We should be dealing with delta G naught prime and delta G prime rather than just delta G and delta G naught. In other words, if I say, delta G naught, because this is going to be in physiological conditions, I know that the concentration of this is 10 to the negative seventh. So now I have the three concentrations I need and I have a way to get Q. So let's do that. Um, I know that it's a lot and it's, it's not exactly the easiest concept, but this, is, this can be a question that you can be asked. So combining the two equations for delta G, understanding how to manipulate the um, uh, this equation to get whatever you're asked for, concentrations, etc. And so I know that this isn't the easiest equation, but it is fair game for an exam. 
So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out delta G. So that is going to be, uh, and once again, I'm going to convert everything to joules. Actually, I'm going to do this one in kilojoules because it's easier, and I'll convert to joules in the next step. So 132 minus uh, 37 plus 237, for, so 310, times 0.46. And that's going to get me to my Gibbs free energy. So 310 times 0.46. Negative 10.6. So delta G is equal to negative 10.6, and the units of this are kilojoules per mole. Kilojoules per mole. Okay. And then I'm going to plug everything in. So negative 10.6 kilojoules per mole is equal to delta G naught, which is negative 3.5 kilojoules per mole. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and erase uh, the pH, or like this part, just because I need the space, um, plus 8.314 joules per mole. So now I need to, I'm actually going to just highlight my units so that I don't forget to change them later, um, times, again, 310, times the natural log of Q. So from this, I just want to get to Q. That's my focus, and then I'll deal with uh, the complicated stuff later. So negative 10.6 plus 3.5, effectively. Um, and then we're going to divide by, actually, from here, I'm going to convert. So I'm going to get negative 7.1 kilojoules per mole. I'm going to convert that to negative 7,100 joules per mole. OK? And then I'm just going to say equals that part and just carry on. So I'm going to divide by 8.314. We're going to divide by 310. And we're going to get a uh, negative 2.75 about. Uh, from that negative 2.75, oh, I should, I should write that. I apologize. Um, 2.75 is equal to the natural log of Q. Once again, to get rid of the natural log, we exponentiate. And we're going to get the number, or the number we get out of that is 0 0.06. Three, six. Okay, Q equals 0 0.0636. And now from there, we have this formula that we figured out up here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kind of copy that in. Concentration of AD, concentration of C, excuse me, concentration of A, H, ATP. Okay, and now comes those last bit of those last details that we figured out. So first, physiological conditions tells us our pH is seven, which tells us our H plus concentration. Great. We have intracellular concentrations of 0.3 molar for ATP and ADP. Okay, so I'm going to plug those in. So equals 0.3 times the concentration of C over the concentration of A times 10 to the negative seventh times 0.3, so the 0.3s can cancel. And then I have 0, 0.0, and I apologize, I know that I'm writing very crooked. I don't intend to. It's just a habit of mine. Uh, C over A times 10 to the negative 7th. I'm going to multiply 10 to the negative 7th. And then I'm going to, well, am I done actually, even once I finish that? then I'd have the, really, the ratio of C to A. So I'm not done because it's asking for the ratio of A to C. Then whatever answer I get out of this, I'm going to reciprocate. And I'm just going to fast forward. The number we get is very big. It is 1.6 times 10 to the 8th. 6 times 10 to the 8th. And that's the problem. Um, I, I highly doubt you're going to get anything as complicated as this on an exam. But having seen it, I know that you all know how to handle it now. So this is kind of the worst case, I hope. Okay. Okay. All right, so if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. If not, we can kind of shift gears to chapter four. Okay. So 
chapter four is the amino acid chapter. And for the most part, we, we kind of very, very briefly talk about amino acids, but we don't go into a ton of depth until this chapter. This chapter is where it gets, goes from, you know, kind of interesting, kind of cool to everyone's least favorite. Um, and the reason is there's a lot of math involved. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So there's an acronym for all of the, for the, the PKAs of all of the side chains that are acidic or basic. And that, that acronym is what you see here. Um, I pronounce it St. Rocky Ched. You can pronounce it however you want. You, you don't have to use it if you don't want. I personally think it's very convenient. So this is based on the one letter code of the amino acid, which you also have to memorize. So S is serine, T is threonine, and I'll get to the actual like side chain part in a bit. R is arginine, which I guess I'll, arginine. R, yeah, okay, K is lysine, which I'm just gonna have to write separately. Y is tyrosine. <clears throat> Excuse me. C is cysteine. H is histidine. Histidine. And then E is glutamic acid or glutamate. Glutamic acid. And D is aspartic acid. Aspartic acid. Okay. So now the order that they're in is basically descending, descending PKAs, okay? So the highest PKAs are S and T, and then it goes down from there. So serine and threonine, and, and that makes sense if, if we have our, uh, our amino acids memorized, excuse me, serine and threonine are both alcohols, so they would have similar PKAs. And in fact, they both have a PKA of about 13, okay? Um, arginines is about 12. And then we get a bit of a jump because um, lysine and tyrosine, oh, wait, tyrosine does not, oh no, yes, that's right, sorry. I always forget that the, um, the phenyl ring of tyrosine affects its PKA because it makes it about 10. Uh, cysteine is about eight. Histidine is about six. And then finally, glutamic acid and aspartic acid are both around four. So I personally think it's a really handy way to just very quickly kind of have an idea of what I'm dealing with. Um, and as you can tell from the next question, this could be fair game. What is the PKA of the side chain of cysteine? Found it, it's eight. Um, you're probably only gonna have one, maybe two of these on an exam because these are very easy questions, but it, it doesn't hurt to have it memorized because you do need it for all kinds of questions. Okay. So now we're gonna just talk a little bit more about the relationship or the um, the various side chains or yeah, side chains of the amino acids. So the first is aromatic rings. So there are three aromatic, um, excuse me, there are three aromatic amino acids. I already spoiled one is tyrosine. It's side group or side chain, excuse me, is a phenyl ring and then an OH, okay? Phenyl alanine is in the name. Um, its side chain looks like that, uh, a phenyl group, and then the side chain of alanine, which is just a, a methyl. Okay, and then threonine and tryptophan. So tryptophan is one that I personally have like half memorized. I know it's got a benzene ring and like another nitrogen ring, but I don't know exactly where the double bonds go on here, something like that. Um, but it does have an aromatic ring. So the answer to this one is threonine. Um, as an added quick little thing, I just want to very briefly run through the one letter codes for these because we can get them mixed up. Tryptophan is W for reasons unknown to me. Uh, tyrosine is Y and phenylalanine is F. Okay. All right. So what kind of bond is formed between two amino acids? So the bond between two amino acids is, and I'm just gonna go ahead and spoil it, it's a peptide bond. But, so the, the way that it's drawn is it's between the N-terminus and the C-terminus, or the amine group and the carboxylic group of two amino acids. 
So uh, for convenience, I'm just going to use glycine since it's the easiest to draw. Um, COOH and NH3. A peptide bond is formed between the N group, the amine group of one, and the carboxylic group of the other. These two together form the bond. And before I, I jump into what the bond actually, how it's formed, very quickly, we're just going to talk about number 11, what is released during the formation of a peptide bond, it's water. Okay. All right. So now let's actually draw out what's happening. So carboxylic group and C and H3 and a lone pair. So this carboxylic group, or I should say, sorry, this, this nitrogen is nucleophilic. And if we think back to organic chemistry, which I know most people don't enjoy, this bond is polar, which makes this carbon electrophilic. Electrophilic. So this is a very great setup for a nucleophilic reaction to happen. This nitrogen is going to attack the carbon. Uh, what happens with traditional um, carbonyl reactions is to, for, to prevent the carbon from having five bonds, the oxygen, uh, the double bond is broken, and then it reforms, and in reforming, it kicks off this OH, okay? But we haven't released water yet. So what ends up happening next? So this is, let me, um, so this is the carbon from the first amino acid. This is the carbon from the second amino acid, just for convenience. So um, these two are connected by, this is still going to have that, and it's going to have N, and that's going to connect to there. This nitrogen now has no lone pairs and Oh, I apologize. This should not be NH3. It should be NH2. I don't know how I didn't catch that. No lone pairs and NH2, which makes this nitrogen positive. We have an OH floating around in solution that's negative. So this oxygen is going to come take this hydrogen, and that lone pair is going to go to the nitrogen, and we get H2O and a peptide bond out of this. Okay? All right. So now let's see what these peptide bonds kind of look like in a chain. So this is a some number of amino acids. I don't, actually don't want to give it away yet because we're going to go through it. So this is the end terminus of both this peptide chain or this polypeptide and of the first amino acid. And this is the C terminus of, once again, the peptide chain and of the last amino acid. So we have the mean group connected to the central carbon. So this is a central carbon, which I'm going to highlight green. OK, awesome. That's connected to a C terminus. So this C terminus has formed an amine, uh, sorry, a peptide bond. So that means that, and I'm just going to use red for this one, this is our first amino acid. Next, we once again have the amine group of the second amino acid. We have central carbon, which once again I'll highlight in green. And we have, once again, a bond to a carboxylic group. So this is our second amino acid, which I'll highlight this one in blue. Or I'll circle it in blue, excuse me. All right. Our next is, once again, we have an amine group. We have our central carbon. And this goes, oh, excuse me, that was supposed to be highlighting. Um, and this actually goes to the end. So our last amino acid, circled in green, is our third. So we have three amino acids here. So now. I'm going to, in yellow, highlight the R groups. So we have a hydrogen on one side, which means this is our R group. We have hydrogen on the top, which makes this our R group. And we actually have hydrogen on both sides, so I'm just going to highlight the bottom. So now, oh, ah, sorry. Oh, goodness, I apologize. Um, so now we need to figure out what these amino acids actually are. So I personally suggest when learning the amino acids, learn the nonpolars first and, and memorize them going up. So for example, I memorize glycine as the first amino acid, even though there's not really numbering to it. And then alanine is the second. Valine, uh, leucine and isoleucine. Leucine and isoleucine, because there are groups increase in size. So this is a hydrogen, this is a CH3, 
this is a C, CH, oh, it's a CH actually, CH3, and then leucine and isoleucine each have four, right? So I memorize it that way because in my head, it, it kind of gives me an order to work with. So based on that order, I know that the last amino acid is glycine. Based on that order also, I know that the first is alanine. And unfortunately, I don't really have much help with this because it's not just one of the regular nonpolars. It's got a sulfur. However, I know that the two amino acids that have sulfur in them are cysteine, cysteine and methionine. methionine. Between these two, I know that methionine is methyl or like carbon, sulfur, carbon. This doesn't have that, so I know it's not methionine, which makes it cysteine. Great, so it's alanine, cysteine, glycine. However, that's not what we're looking for. We need the one letter codes of the amino acids. In this case, it ends up being really easy because it's just the first letters. So A, C, G, but it could be a lot more complicated. It could be glutamic acid, in which case you'll need an E. It could be glutamine, could it be aspartate or asparagine, whatever the case may be. It could be one of those weird ones that isn't just the first letter. So always just check your work to make sure that you're not uh, falling into that trap. Okay, does that make sense? Are we okay with kind of the, the basics of amino acids? And if you have any questions, please feel free to type it in the chat anytime. I just, uh, I'm not sure. Oh, okay, awesome. So just a few more to go. Uh, gets a little bit harder, unfortunately, but the, the last one it, that's kind of related to this idea is what happens to the C-terminus of a polypeptide and why? So our N-terminus and our C-terminus each have their own pKa as well. Our N-terminus is basic and our C-terminus is acidic. However, <clears throat> our, uh, or, I'm sorry, so because they have their own pKa, we have to know those pKa's. Um, and so in a free amino acid, so I'm just going to draw glycine because, again, it's easy. Um, uh, NH2, the numbers that are most commonly used are 2 and 9. So pKa of 9, pKa of 2. However, in a polypeptide, we don't use 2. In a polypeptide, we say that the C-terminus has a pKa of 4, okay? So it's a very sharp increase, or change, I should say. Um, and the reason for this change in pKa is because of, and again, thinking back to OCHEM, it's that inductive effect, uh, let me write that up, inductive effect that pushes electron density toward this carboxylic group and changes the pKa, or I should say toward this carboxylic group, because there's so many more carbons and nitrogens in that chain, as opposed to this, which just has a single one and can't, can't be as effective. So that's just something um, to keep in mind for kind of the next few questions, um, and really just in general when we're doing this now. Okay, all right, so we're near the end. We have one more situation with three questions to it, and these are where we get into the actual, the harder part of this unit. So these are all going to relate to YAK. So what are the amino acids and their three-letter codes? So A, we discussed up here is alanine. So I'm just going to say A is alanine. And then Y and K are both in the acronym for St. Rocky Chad. So if you don't remember, you can look back to there. Uh, y is lysine. Or, no, I'm sorry. Y is tyrosine and K is lysine. Excuse me. Um, y is tyrosine. Tyrosine. And K is lysine. Okay, awesome. So we at least know the amino acids. Now their three-letter codes tend to be a little bit easier than the one-letter codes because they tend to just be the first letter, uh, the first three letters for most of them. So T-Y-R, uh, A is next, so A-L-A. -A. And then lysine is L-Y-S, okay? Um, yeah, so that's, that's an easy one. This is where it gets a little bit harder. So the isoelectric point of the polypeptide, this is also written as P-I, uh, lowercase p, capital I, just like P-H, just like uh, P-O-H, et cetera. And the isoelectric point is defined as the pH or the range of pHs, usually you just give one value, in which the net charge of the polypeptide 
is zero. So the reason I say net charge is because various things are going to be protonated and deprotonated at various points. But when you add them all together at this, at this point, at this pH, the net charge should be zero. So before we get into this specific problem, I want to just talk a little bit about a quick review of pH and pKa. So the way that I think of it is the pKa is a threshold. So I'm going to use cysteine as an example. Cysteine has a pKa of 8. Okay, And so the pH is, let's say, is greater than 8, so maybe a pH of 10. What that means is we have less H plus in solution. When we have less H plus in solution, the CH2, the SH group, this thiol group, is going to lose is its H plus because it it wants to help or because it's um it's more acidic than the solution, so it's going to be an acid and release its hydrogen. Okay. Uh, S plus, and that's the the R group. In other words, when pH is greater than pKa, um, amino acid, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to say the amino acid for now. The amino acid is deprotonated. Obviously, this applies to all acids and bases, not just amino acids, but uh, deprotonated. Okay. On the other hand, if we're at a pH less than 8, so maybe a pH of like 4, that means that there's tons of H plus in solution. Okay, since there's so much H plus in solution, any, well not any, but for the most part, your, your molecules should all be uh, set, um, what's called protonated. So, oh, no, that should be negative, excuse me. So if you have any deprotonated cysteines, they're going to get protonated. Okay, so eight, uh, the pKa of eight is the threshold for cysteine. Below its pKa, it gets protonated, and above its pKa, it gets deprotonated. Okay, and I'll, I'll write out that little blurb just like I did last time. When pH is less than pKa, the amino acid is protonated. Okay, so I used pHs of four and 10, but in the case of serine, 10 is still lower than its pKa, so just kind of keep that in mind. All right, so that's the first type of situation. So in the case of cysteine, it's going to be negative here and neutral here. Okay, but what if we look at something like arginine? Um, and I don't, I'll just keep going to the right. Um, so arginine, arginine has a pKa, we can just look up if we don't remember, it's somewhere around 10, uh, 12, excuse me. So arginine has a pKa of 12. 12. And arginine's side chain is several carbons, and then nitrogen bonded to a carbon, bonded to nitrogen, bonded to nitrogen, and then I think this is a double bond. Uh, this is attached to hydrogen, this is an NH2, and this is hydrogen. Um, the exact structure isn't the most important. I'm going to focus on this part of it because this is the important part. So C, NH2. Well, when we're at a pH, uh, when we're at a pKa, or no, I'm sorry, when we are at a pH of, say, 14, this is going to stay in this form. But when we go to a pH of, say, 6, I don't know, just something lower, we're going to end up getting protonated. And so we take on, oh, does not have lone pairs in this case. So it takes on this form and becomes positive. So depending on whether the side chain is, generally speaking, acidic or basic, it'll either be like cysteine and take on a negative charge or a neutral charge, or it'll be like arginine and take on a neutral charge or a positive charge. So that's something that kind of complicates things that a lot of people get confused and that I get mixed up from time to time myself. Um, so just generally speaking, if side chain K 
contains OH or SH, it becomes negative when deprotonated and neutral when protonated. On the other hand, if side chain contains, and when I say contains, I mean has it like external, but pretty much all of them in this case are. Um, NH2, it'll be neutral when deprotonated and positive when protonated. Does that make sense? Should I go over that again? Like, uh, I want to pause here because this is a confusing part. I'm hearing no complaints, but if I do get any, please just type them in the chat. I will not be offended. Um, OK, so now back to the actual question. Let's calculate the PI of this peptide. So in order to do that, we need to ask ourselves, what parts of our peptide contribute to pH? So I'm going to draw N, Y, A, K, C. And the reason I do that is because our N terminus and our C terminus contribute to, P, uh, contribute to acidity, charge, whatever you call it. Um, so I know that the N-terminus has a pKa. I know that tyrosine has a pKa. I know that alanine does not. I know that lysine does, and I know that the carboxylic group, the C-terminus, does as well. So now, since I have four, I'm going to just write out their, um, their pKa's. So the N-terminus is around 9. Tyrosine is around 10. Lysine is uh, 6. And our C-terminus, which, be careful, this is not cysteine. It's our C-terminus. Uh, let me, yeah, let me put C terminus, so T as a subscript to cl clarify that, is going to be 4 because of what we talked about in question 13. Okay, so now I like to put these in descending order. So 10, 9, 6, and 4, and I like to leave a little space. What I do is I draw a dotted line under each of them. Okay, so now I think of these as thresholds. Uh, sorry, I need to more space. So below a, PA, a pH of 4, it's going to have a charge. Between 6 and 4, it'll have a charge. Between 9 and 6, it'll have a charge. Between 10 and 9, it'll have a charge. And above 10, it'll have a charge. So what we can do is start at one end, figure out what the charge is at that point. Is it 0? No, go to the next one. Is it 0? No, go to the next one, and so on. Okay, so I'm going to start at a pH of above 10. So above a pH of 10, everything will be deprotonated. When the N-terminus is deprotonated, it's neutral. When tyrosine is deprotonated, it's negative. When lysine is deprotonated, it's neutral. When the C-terminus is deprotonated, it's negative. So above a pH of 10, our polypeptides are going to have a charge of negative 2. Between 9 and 10, let's see, our N-terminus will be deprotonated still, so it'll be neutral. Tyrosine will be protonated. And so at this point, it'll now be neutral. Uh, lysine won't be affected, and our C-terminus will be the same. So now, between a pH of 9 and a pH of 10, our, uh, our polypeptide's net charge is negative 1. Um, between 6 and 9, let's go through it. So in this case, our N-terminus is now protonated, and so it'll be positive. Tyrosine is protonated and neutral. Lysine is deprotonated and neutral. And our C-terminus is deprotonated and negative. And so this is zero. So we could stop here, but I want to keep going to show the trend, even though it's, it's kind of obvious. And I want to talk about why this trend may not always work. Okay, so between four and six. So our N terminus and tyrosine aren't going to change. They're going to be positive and zero. Lysine is going to change. Lysine is now going to be protonated and positive, And our C terminus will still be negative. And so this will add up to positive one. Now below pH of four, N terminus positive, tyrosine neutral, lysine positive, carboxylic group C terminus neutral. This is going to be plus two. This trend of increasing or decreasing by one, depending on which way you go, is fairly consistent. It, it works sometimes, but not all the time. And the reason is if I had had, say, E glutamate in this example, 
between six and four, like once I get to below four, it's going to change by two because this thing also has a pKa of four. So while it might be convenient to say, okay, I'm just going to calculate it at one end and then increase or decrease by one from there, I very strongly suggest you go through each individual one until you reach zero, because if you don't, you may fall into that trap and you may, uh, this may end up being plus three, so you may end up getting them wrong because of that. Um, okay, so coming back to this question. When we are asked for isoelectric point, they don't want a range. So even though somewhere between pH 6 to pH 9 is the is a correct answer, it's not going to be the correct answer. The reason for that is because the correct answer is the average of the two. So you take them and divide by two and you get 7.5. So the pi of this polypeptide is 7.5. Okay. Does all of that make sense? Does anyone have any questions, et cetera? Um, I'm gonna pause here once again and take a drink of water and give anyone a chance to ask questions. I'm not hearing or seeing any questions, so I'm just gonna move on to the very last one. And this is one of the easier ones in comparison to number 15. Um, <clears throat> and especially because if we need to, we can always reference number 12. Okay. So draw the polypeptide. It's pretty easy. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of draw the backbone first, and then I'm going to draw the R groups. So what I like to do is I'm going to start with my first carbon. And this is going to be the carbon of tyrosine because tyrosine is our first. Okay. I'm going to draw. NH2, because that's our amine group. Then I'm going to draw hydrogen on this side and an R group here, and I'm going to leave that blank for now. And then I'm going to draw carbon. That carbon is going to have a double bond to an oxygen, and then a bond to the next nitrogen over. That's going to have a bond to a hydrogen and to the next central carbon. So this is the first central carbon. This is central carbon of tyrosine. This is the second central carbon. And this is the central carbon of alanine. alanine. Okay. So from the central carbon, I have a hydrogen and an R group, which I'm again going to leave blank. Then coming here, I'm going to once again draw the carboxylic group, draw the nitrogen bonded to the hydrogen, and draw the final central carbon. And this is the central carbon for lysine. lysine. Okay, and then from this, I'm going to draw my carboxylic acid. Oh, and that was drawn with an extra double bond by mistake. Let's just fix that. Okay. And once again, I have hydrogen and an R group, which I'm going to leave blank for a second. So I personally like to draw the backbones first because sometimes it can get a little bit confusing. It's kind of alternating carbon, nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen, but not really. Um, so I just, I don't want to get mixed up. So I like to draw the backbone in one go. If you, if you want to draw each individual amino acid, that, that's more than acceptable, obviously. It's just, it helps me personally think. So I know that my R groups for each of my amino acids now <coughs> need to be drawn. Um, thankfully, thankfully, this is the part where we've had to memorize them, so it shouldn't be too hard. Um, so let's just start off with tyrosine, since I talked about it a few times and generally talked about its structure. Tyrosine has Excuse me. Tyrosine has a single CH2, CH3, whatever you call it, a methyl group, and then its benzene ring or its phenyl ring, and then an OH. So when I draw this, I'm going to draw that. And coming from it, I'm going to draw a phenyl and an OH. Okay. Alanine is the easy one. It's CH3. Done. Um, and then lysine. Lysine is I always struggle with lysine because I always forget how many carbons it has. I believe it's four carbons and then an NH2. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then an NH2. So that's it. Uh, well, that's kind of it. Um, this question is intentionally kept broad so that I can bring this up. 
usually the question will be something along the lines of draw the polypeptide at a certain point. So this could be at pH of four. This could be at a pH of eight or 12 or whatever. And the reason that I kept it vague is just I wanna draw the R groups and not much else. If you have to draw it at a pH of four, then we need to account for, let's see, I'm gonna just highlight. This would need to be protonated. That would stay the same. Oops. Um, that would stay the same. That would stay the same. This would need to be protonated. This is, we're at four, so it's okay staying protonated, um, but it's a gray area. If it's at eight, we might have to do something different. If it's at 12, we'd have to do something different. So just keep track of what pH you're at and adjust what needs to be adjusted accordingly. So the things you're almost always gonna have to adjust, C and N termin, terminus, termini, uh, um, adjust your acidic and basic side chains. Side chains plus N term plus C term, okay? So those are things to just keep track of as you're going, make sure that you, uh, you change what needs to be changed for the pH stuff. Okay, so that is our week two review. Um, next week, uh, we are gonna talk about, if I remember correctly, a couple more amino acid questions. We're gonna talk a lot about um, post-translational modifications, which should be interesting, and a little bit more of the math. So it, are there any questions before we end off today, actually? Okay, then I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording. And uh, 